Owl. And this recording will be uploaded to YouTube afterwards. Um, if you do not want to be featured in the video, um, please um, turn off your video and your camera now. Fantastic. And I will fortunately spotlight myself for everyone here. Um, welcome to this month's Fireside Chat, um, hosted by the Turing Way. Um, my name is Anne Lee Steele. I am the community manager um, for the Turing Way, and I'll be kicking off this session to tell you a little bit more about our project uh, before passing the mic to Jennifer Ding and Mariel Bennett um, to take it away for this month's Fireside Chat. So a little bit about um, the Turing Way, um, we're an open source, open collaboration and community developed handbook for data science. And our goal is to make reproducible, ethical and collaborative data science possible um, and make it both accessible and comprehensible for everyone. And while I'm kicking off the session today, um, I'm part of a wider team that includes Ariel and Jen and many others, um, some of which are here. Um, and represent the wider and international community of researchers um, and practitioners who have created this shared resource. Um, they themselves bring perspectives from their fields, their countries, their backgrounds, and lived experiences. We are hosted by, but not exclusive to, the Alan Turing Institute, which is the UK's National Centre for Data Science and Artificial Intelligence, and our project is located in the Tools, Practices, and Systems program, which we will link um, in the chat. The TPS program helps to strategize and implement open infrastructure within the Institute across various areas of research and nationally across the UK. The, this Fireside Chat series itself has been very much an effort towards creating shared spaces across open science, open source, um, open knowledge communities, and indeed the wider opens ecosystem, where people can gather and exchange concerns, explore challenges, and share different practices that work in their context to build allyship and understand each other's work and perspectives just a little bit better. So with that being said, this is a very special fireside chat um, co-created in the context of the open source initiatives um, call for best um, practices and de defining open source AI. Um, and I'm really excited about this month's topic, um, who is building open source AI, uh, which aims to center the lived experiences of debt workers and complement with critical research in order to understand this ongoing um, discourse that we have within our wider communities. A few housekeeping things um, before we get started. Um, as I've been sharing in the chat here, we have a shared etherpad to facilitate written note taking and invite ideas from you all um, who have joined to listen in. Please feel free to add questions there or in the chat um, and we'll make sure to post them to be used afterwards, um, either in the FAQ um, towards the end of this call or um, for answering later on after this session. We also have a code of conduct um, that applies to this event to ensure accessibility and respectful collaboration. Um, for any concerns, reporting of an incident that makes you feel uncomfortable at this call, or further ideas to improve accessibility, please email turingway at turing.ac.uk. And you can directly reach out to me um, or to Jen or to Ariel by emailing um, our Turing emails, information of which will be provided in the Etherpad. Just a reminder, um, but um, we are holding the Zoom room open after this um, hour long call for an additional 30 minutes for an unrecorded open discussion. It is completely optional, um, but it is where we're able to turn off the recordings and ask questions of each other and ourselves in perhaps a less formal space um, than this one. And it usually ends up being a very interesting conversation. And with all of those logistics out of the way, I am delighted to hand over the mic to Jennifer um, to kick us off. Thank you very much, Anne, for that introduction uh, to the Turing Way and the fireside chat that is about to happen. So now I'll just give a quick introduction to the panel before we get started. So the panelists will, in a few minutes, provide a bit more information about themselves and their backgrounds, but to briefly highlight each one right now. I believe they're also highlighted on your screens. Um, in today's panel, we have Marzier, who's a senior research scientist at Cohere for AI. We have Abhinaya, who's CTO at Nunari Labs and language ambassador with Cohere for AI. Both are part of the AYA initiative, which is an open science project. Um, Cohere for AI has started to build a multilingual language model. Next on the panel, we have David, who's a postdoctoral fellow at Cornell Tech. 
You may have come across his recent paper with Sarah West and Meredith Whitaker um, on topics very relevant to what we will discuss today. The paper is called Open for Business, Big Tech, Concentrated Power and the Political Economy of Open AI. And last but not least, we have Mofat, who's organizer of the African Content Moderators Union and former content moderator for ChatGPT. If you have read about OpenAI's content moderation practices in Kenya when building ChatGPT, that's because of Mofat and his colleagues who brought these stories to light. So I'll now just pop some links in the chat in case you'd like to learn more um, about the work of our panelists. Uh, we're very lucky to have them with us today. So as Anne mentioned, um, today's panel will be facilitated by Ariel Bennett, who's um, a core team member of the Turing Way and program manager of the Tools, Practices and Systems program at Turing, and myself, Jennifer Ding, senior researcher also from Turing and on the TPS and Turing Way teams. So um, today's panel is part of the OSI deep dive into defining open source AI, which runs through October. Um, and what we will focus on today and really aim to contribute to that conversation is centered on this question that is the title of the event, who is building open source AI? This question is very much inspired by our panelists today who are through their work and personal initiatives shining a light on communities who are very much part of building AI, but whose contributions are often overlooked. This includes content moderators, data curators and stewards, and even data subjects whose work and data make current AI possible. And for the open source AI ecosystem, we will discuss opportunities to improve practices of reward and recognition for this global ecosystem of contributors, as well as what the possibilities and limitations are of openness in AI. How can AI openness expand participation and enable more people to shape the future of AI? And where is openness not enough to achieve some of the other outcomes we want, like more responsible, auditable, and democratic AI? So um, today we have folks in the room from India, Kenya, the Netherlands, the UK, the US, and more. And we're really excited to have this conversation together. So to get things started, I will now hand it over to Ariel to kick off the panel. Hi there, everyone, and uh, welcome. Um, without further ado, I'd love to ask Abhinaya to introduce herself and uh, start with our opening question, which is what brings you to this panel today on who is building open source AI? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Ariel. Uh, so hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Abhinaya Mahendran. Uh, I'm the CTO of a startup called Nunari Labs, which is based out of Coimbatore uh, in India, which is a small tire to city in India. And I also hold a part-time program manager role at IIT Madras, where I manage an open source project uh, called Hidden Voices, which is aimed at reducing the gender gap in Wikipedia biography. So that's another project that I kind of manage in the open source ecosystem. Um, I am primarily here because of AYA, which is Coir for AI's uh, Open Science Initiative, where I have volunteered myself to be an ambassador for Tamil language. Uh, because the aim of AYA is to collect high quality data sets for uh, 101 underrepresented languages across the world. And Tamil uh, being one of the Indic languages uh, is an underrepresented language. Uh, so I've been part of uh, many open source initiatives right from my college time till now. Uh, in some of the initiatives, I've been a volunteer, uh, whereas in others, I've been managing the project or uh, guiding them technically, managing the people, uh, everything. And I come from an applied research background. So in order to, you know, uh, do something on the research side, I started contributing to open source projects because that's a good way to connect with a lot of researchers, learn from them. And even if I have any, any ideas, probably that would be the place to collaborate with people and uh, you know make it a reality. So that's how I got into open, open source uh, ecosystem as such. Uh, I'm also trying to build a community locally, uh, as in in Tamil Nadu, where we wanted to focus on building uh, exclusive LLMs for Tamil, uh, because uh, Tamil being one of the underrepresented languages, we also wanted to uh, continue uh, to coexist with whatever advancements are happening in the AI space. So, uh, I mean, that's my primary motive why I uh, joined AYA also, because that helps us with the data set curation and all that. Um, uh, other than all this, uh, uh, like I, I just wanted to be here because uh, one thing is all of us here are part of 
some form of open source ecosystem and probably uh, we all would have faced different kind of scenarios and we would have dealt with it in a different way. So I just wanted to learn from the panelists so that in whatever future tasks that I take, take, uh, you know, take part of, I just wanted to make sure that, you know, I use those strategies. So I think I'm here mainly to learn and also share whatever little experience I have uh, with others. Yeah, that's, that's about me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amanaya. Uh, moving on to Moffat now, please introduce yourself and tell us what brings you here today. Yeah, hi everyone. My name is Mofat Ocheng uh, from Nairobi, Kenya. I have a background in uh, training data that is used to train um, AI tools. Um, I've also been a content moderator and we are now trying to organize um, tech workers in Kenya and in Africa to ensure that we uh, have better working conditions and everything just works well as it ought to be. So um, I'm here to discuss that and also to share my experiences at, uh, as a content moderator uh, and as a tech worker. So um, I'm also uh, a committee member uh, of a union that is trying to mobilize um, Africans, uh, tech workers. Uh, it's called African Content Moderators Union. And uh, I'm in charge of training um, and education in the union. So that's why I'm here. And I believe uh, we'll have a very productive session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mova. Really great that you've been here today. Um, I'd like to invite Marzia now to uh, introduce herself. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm joining from Amsterdam, which is quite rainy and gray today. So the best time to have a fireside chat, uh, probably. Uh, yes, I'm Marzia. I'm a senior research scientist at Cohere for AI. Uh, my background uh, is in NLP, machine translation in particular. I got my PhD here from University of Amsterdam, and uh, I have joined Cohere for AI for uh, less than a year now. Uh, nine months almost. Uh, we are a, a research lab that is a nonprofit, part of the Cohere company, and our aim is to work on fundamental research questions uh, in the field of uh, NLP, machine learning, uh, and AI. And uh, it includes a lot of different areas and aspects. So we have uh, projects that we work in the lab internally. We also have uh, collaborative projects with uh, different universities and uh, companies. Uh, and most importantly and relevant for this panel is uh, the, the community projects that we have. So as part of our open uh, science initiative, this year in January, we launched the AYA project, which uh, as Abinaya also mentioned, is uh, the aim is to build a multilingual language model with the help of the people in the world. So uh, starting with 100 languages and uh, asking the collaborators and volunteers all over the world to help us uh, uh, build this resource, which includes both the data sets uh, as well as the, the models. Uh, and the aim is to release that and hopefully uh, it will be helpful for especially a lot of these low resource languages that didn't have this uh, kind of data uh, and model before. Uh, I'm very excited for today's panel. I'm especially excited just to see different points of view about what are the gains, what are the upsides of open sourcing these artifacts, as well as what are the challenges and what we should be mindful for. Uh, so very excited for that today. Thank you very much. Um... Finally, David, please introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is David Witter. Um, I'm a postdoctoral fellow at Cornell Tech, um, and I recently finished my PhD in from the school, uh, earned my PhD from the School of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon. Um, a lot of my doctoral research um, focused on free and open source software, as well as some of my ongoing work. Um, so I'm really excited to be here today and you know, as you just said, learn from everyone else. Um, so history will show us that um, free software began as sort of a way to resist uh, corporate control of software. But um, we see more recently how open source software has been embraced by big tech and how open source software can indeed entrench the interests of big tech. Uh, back in the 90s, we saw how IBM invested in Linux to undermine Microsoft's Windows. So how 
you know, even open source platforms can become sort of a way to uh, uh, for for tech, large technology company companies to um, entrench their interests. But even more recently in the AI um, space, we see how Mark Zuckerberg um, has spoken quite plainly about how their control over PyTorch allows them to set uh, the standard for AI and then more easily commercialize um, free um, like the labor of open source contributors. Um, but, and this is now drawing on some of my more recent work with Meredith and Sarah, even when AI is open source, AI requires a lot of massive resources to use, um, lots of compute, lots of data, a lot of access to resources to hire workers to train and build this AI. So while openness can allow um, like transparency and extensibility, it doesn't always, it, and it in fact doesn't democratize access to AI, which is a technology that is inherently difficult to democratize. So if we're gonna ask in this panel, like who is building open source AI um, and who actually has the resources to use AI in a real world context, it's primarily big tech companies who have access to these resources. Um, and with that being said, I know we all have, you know, interesting perspectives on that, on, on that topic. So I'm really excited to be here and learn, learn from you all today. Great, I'm handing over to Jen to dive into the discussion. Thank you all for those introductions. A lot of really interesting um, and ranging perspectives on the panel today. So our first question, and we'd like to start uh, by asking Malfat is, who do you think is involved in building AI that the general public might not know about? And why is that? So over to you, Mothat, um, for this first question to get us started. Uh, okay, thank you for the question. So uh, for me, I will say um, content moderators are involved in, um, in developing open source um, AI, but uh, general public are not aware of them. Um, I will say that uh, people are not aware of content moderators because um, for the longest time, um, we've been working under curtains. Uh, no one knows uh, that what we are doing exists. Uh, for instance, uh, we've been moderating um, content uh, from the big social media platforms like Facebook, uh, Instagram, um, even the YouTube itself, and TikTok now. So uh, many people don't know what content moderation is. Uh, and if I get time, I would just uh, like to highlight what content moderation is. So content moderation is uh, the way of filtering out sensitive content uh, that um, might not be uh, legal uh, to go to the general public. So um, when people post such like content on the social media, they first uh, pass through us and then we filter them. Uh, and then we just allow what is uh, legal to go out and what is illegal not to go out. So that's what content moderation is. And for the longest period of time, uh, people, especially in the global south, uh, people don't know that that work exists and it's there. Yeah. So I think content moderators are not known to the public. Till now, people are, are still struggling to understand what's content moderation or what's content moderators. So it's still something that is uh, not uh, known to the general public. Thank you, Mafat, for sharing that description with us and also um, more widely too through your work um, in interviews so that more people around the world know what the experience of content moderation is like and also some of the real challenges that content moderators have to go through um, in order to make the systems, um, AI systems that are live um, safer. Um, so now if I can direct this question to Abhinaya as well, um, who do you think is involved in building AI that the public might not know about and why is that? Okay, uh, so coming from a technical background uh, uh, and working on a lot of projects, I know there are so many roles that are involved in building any kind, any kind of AI system for that matter, not just open source AI. But uh, the point is some of the roles are glorified so much uh, in, in a way that other roles are kind of you know, put behind the curtain and people do not even know uh, such roles exist. For example, data curation and data labeling is a major process in any kind of uh, AI building uh, you know, process. But then 
not many people uh, are aware at least technical side yes many might be aware of such roles but when you talk about consumers as a consumer of an ai model or any ai platform i might i might not know who are all involved in building that platform uh, the main reason is because i think it's a mindset issue like people think that some roles are above the other and probably they uh, kind of glorify those roles and even people talk about it a lot so they get to know it but other roles even though they are as important as uh, a data scientist or an ml engineer uh, some roles like data labelers are not talked about much uh, i think uh, to change that we we as you know people who are technical we should start talking about uh, those roles to the public and i think that's how they'll get to know uh, i don't see any other way around it uh, maybe i guess even the data curation process itself is not seen uh, as a big thing in you know in industry right like people don't spend too much time curating data they just opt for say some kind of augmentation just build the models automatically like without even trying to uh, build a system around collecting data or curating it properly so i guess it's, it's a mindset uh, shift that needs to happen uh, so that people get to know about all these additional roles uh, even for that matter people who deal with responsible ai ethicists people who set up regulation i think all these roles are not known to the public just because of uh, the reason it is not being talked about much i guess that's that's what i feel it's a great point. A lot of our conversations really focus on model centric thinking um, and then a glorification of the kinds of people who might be more involved with that kind of work. Um, whereas the data work um, at all ends of an AI system are really crucial um, for how they end up working. So before we move on to the next question, just to check with Marzier and David, anything you would like to add to this question of uh, focusing it in on the who? Um, Marzia, I see you've unmuted. Uh, yeah, I think both like Mofat and Abinaya mentioned really important uh, players and actors in building uh, resources today. Uh, but I do also, so the, I saw there was a uh, comment about like what we mean by AI in the chat earlier, like what what how we are defining it. And I think if we are talking about who is currently involved in building AI, it can be essentially anyone. Uh, if you are talking about scale, then it's a bit different. Uh, but uh, yeah, we, it, it can be anyone. So with that comes a lot of positive uh, points, uh, but maybe also some things that uh, we should think twice about. Uh, uh, but yeah, it's not really uh, specific to any uh, uh, university company, uh, even like people with specifically like computer science backgrounds nowadays, I would say. And just to add a, a different quirk to what um, Marzea said there, um, I, if we think about who's involved in building AI that the general public might not be aware of, I would say the general public is involved in building AI and often isn't aware of it. Um, I think we need to conceive of AI as an attempt to uh, collect and uh, profit off our work in digital traces online. Um, AI is trained on our data, often without our knowledge or consent, um, and labeled by underpaid and underrecognized uh, global gig workers, and then oftentimes profited off by the only large companies that actually have the sort of resources, computational, et cetera, to make use of it. Um, so in that framing, um, we're all involved in building AI and then through the use of our data, um, but few of us are recognized for this and fewer, th and fewer than that are able to actually share in the benefits from finished AI systems. It's a great call out, um, this imbalance of who is contributing and putting time and labor and energy into AI systems versus who is benefiting and profiting. Um, and I think this leads actually very well to our next question. So I'll hand over to Ariel for that. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and great to kick this off. Um, so the, moving on to the second question I have is, uh, what practices of acknowledging and supporting the work of this wider ecosystem of contributors to open source AI has the panel observed? So we've talked about the general public not necessarily being aware of all the people and uh, different groups that are contributing to building open source AI. Obviously in the ecosystem, we have a, a greater awareness and understanding of what it really takes to build and train and, and you know moderate these models. So what currently exists in the ecosystem to acknowledge all of the work that goes into that and 
do you think that there's anything that's maybe lacking or should be done more widely, examples of best practice, etc.? Um, and we're coming to uh, Marzia first for this. Uh, yeah, that's a, a good question. Also coming right after what David said, like there are like everyone is like we are all contributing uh, by any sort of data that we have put online somewhere at some point in our lives. Uh, so I think maybe we, we can differentiate between uh, uh, conscious and like contribution with consent versus contribution that we or like people didn't necessarily know uh, uh, that they were doing. Uh, so when we talk about people that are actually part of this ecosystem of building uh, these uh, AI models, uh, I think it's uh, it really depends on uh, a lot of different factors. So my uh, experience I can talk about uh, our experience in uh, in the AYA project. So for that particular project, uh, the aim was that trying to have, uh, so we started by uh, wanting to have one universal language model that covers 100 languages. So trying to unify everything together, uh, having this like one axis of language, uh, but that soon turned into all of the 100 languages needing individual attention and individual care, just because of how different they are, how uh, if you want to be mindful of uh, the culture, cultural sensitivity and uh, different specific region specific uh, necessities that you need to pay attention to each of these languages. So then the, the, the volunteers that we had were from all of these 100 uh, uh, places that speak these languages. And how we acknowledge that uh, was through different uh, ways that we thought would be uh, motivating, but also hopefully rewarding for those people. So if they are, so there are also like two, usually two different types of people that we work with. So one are students who would like to have this as a like contribution to an open source project as part of their uh, resume and like trying to, to build something uh, in their career. Uh, but then there are also like people who just want to contribute, just like volunteer work. Uh, we have been trying to have like things like uh, giving dig digital certification uh, for different number of contributions in this project. And once you pass a certain number, uh, we have project specific swags that we are going to send to people. So uh, t-shirts, like sweatshirts, like things like that, so that people feel like they're like part of one big project, everyone together. And then with more contributions and uh, stronger players, uh, we do want to acknowledge them on, uh, on the paper that we are gonna release either as like co-authors in the acknowledgement. So definitely trying to, uh, meets uh, the expectation of the people that are volunteering. Uh, so this is one way that we have been trying. I'm sure there are like a lot of uh, missing parts and different ways that we should be uh, doing. And that's something that we are learning as we go forward. Uh, but I think that's very, uh, especially in a, in a volunteer work like this, uh, you still want to uh, give back something to people that hopefully uh, they are proud of to be part of this project. Hey, thanks, Marcia. And yeah, it's really interesting to hear all the different uh, mechanisms for reward and recognition that uh, you've already established as well. Uh, I, I just wanted to uh, bring in Moffat on this question as well around um, recognition, acknowledgement that exists at the moment and, and what you'd like to see. Ah, okay, thank you. Um, for content moderators here in Kenya, um, content moderators come from different countries in Africa because we moderate different African languages and also English and Swahili. So we are a diverse community. Um, so in content moderation, uh, what um, the companies we work for uh, focus on is, is um, quantity of the videos we watch and filter. So to encourage uh, folks to filter more videos and filter more content, we have uh, awards and recognitions. So uh, we always award uh, top uh, top performers. Um, with uh, we 
they are sometimes given uh, gift cards and uh, some vouchers. We also have uh, team bondings to bring people together uh, because we come from different countries. So if you have some kind of team bonding and games, uh, it brings people together. Uh, so those are things that are happening internally and uh, they are not being published to the general public to know. Uh, those are um, internal arrangements. So I think what needs to be done uh, is to ensure that if these things are done, uh, they can be published published for the general public to know uh, that this award is given to the general uh, to content moderators and also uh, what we are lacking uh, as content moderators is um, legislations that can protect us and protect our mental health so for instance you find that uh, content moderators uh, you just work you see uh, this disturbing and crazy content and then um, there is no law protecting you uh, there is no psychological support you are getting. So I think if the uh, if the government uh, can put some legislations that protect tech workers, especially content moderators, then that can be really good. And also, um, uh, yeah, in Africa, um, we work for companies that uh, outsource work to Africa. Um, most of these big tech companies that we work for come from Europe. So I think um, if the European government can also make some laws that govern um, the investors that come to Africa, I think that can also really help us. Because uh, if these investors come and they find that there is no law that governs their operations in these countries, then they, um, uh, they affect so many people. Uh, for instance, uh, if you if you do this content moderation job uh, without uh, psychological support and then uh, after some time you get some uh, mental illness you cannot go and claim uh, to anybody that uh, the work that you are doing affected you because at the end of the day they will say you opt in so i think uh, we just need legislations to protect tech workers especially content moderators and then we also want our content moderation to be recognized as a profession uh, because uh, we, most of us are now working as casual workers, and this is a very professional job that should be recognized globally. So I think um, if this uh, work can be professionalized, uh, so that even if you advise uh, advertising a job, you you have um, some kind of um, very defined job descriptions, and then uh, you have a defined uh, job title, and then you have uh, some kind of uh, defined qualifications and hiring procedures, then that can work. Because in most cases, uh, when these companies advertise these jobs, uh, they advertise them as, 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 as customer support job. But if you go there, you find that you are doing a very different thing. So I think legislation uh, is very important. Are not just in the countries that do these uh, jobs like Kenya, but also in Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bofa. Um, and yeah, some really interesting perspectives there, particularly around professionalization of the uh, role of content moderators, whereas at, at the moment it's very much viewed as sort of an outsourced, highly casualized um, piece of, of work to be taken on. So I think that's uh, interesting. And there's a few uh, things in the uh, uh, notepad that I think we will get to as part of the Q&A um, for those that are arising from there. Um, I just want to invite Abinaya and David as well to um, uh, see if they'd like to contribute to this question around current practices around recognition and whether there's uh, things missing or that you'd like to see done more widely as well. Yeah, so maybe from my experience working on uh, different kind of projects where uh, in some projects we asked for code contribution. So uh, students or researchers who would like to contribute code, uh, they'll be rewarded with authorship of the paper. So if we write a paper about it, so we generally uh, in the past we have given authorship as, a, as an incentive to people who have contributed. Uh, in other cases, uh, I have seen uh, like... Uh, research research institutions uh, they uh, actually pay them money for the time they spend on curating data because uh, linguists for example uh, that will be their means of income right like that's their skill and they can make money out of that skill so uh, just to compensate their time uh, on curating good data for open source projects they have been given uh, like money as an incentive so I guess again it's very subjective because a different group of people expect different kind of incentive uh, there is no way to actually standardize everything because uh, the projects might be uh, dealing with different kind of 
work and uh, there is a cultural aspect there is a political aspect there are a lot of things you need to take care of but uh, i have seen these kind of incentives uh, given out in the past projects and even in aya for that matter like uh, mazia mentioned uh, there are a lot of we are uh, you know uh, we are also uh, providing authorship for like people who have done very good uh, contribution in terms of collecting high quality data. But other than that, we are all, they are also giving swags, uh, digital certificates, etc. So I guess uh, again, it's a subjective thing uh, to you know fig figuring out what is the right incentive for the right group of people. I think that comes uh, as a trial and error only. And I just briefly, I think everyone else said it really well, but. Um... I like to think of this as a, sort of a supply chain question. Um, like the final product is sort of what you see, but there's like tons of work that goes in before it that often is, isn't recognized. So I really liked what Abhinaya said of like um, recognizing data work um, because anyone who builds machine learning systems will tell you AI systems are only as good as the data you have, garbage in, garbage out. Um, but the work to like label and curate that data set is so often under-recognized or just sort of invisible even to the people building the machine learning system. So um, so I think that we ought to like find ways to make that work visible, uh, make that work, you know, as uh, well paid and, uh, and as recognized as the um, as the final, uh, the people coding the thing. So strong agreement with everyone else here. Great. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to hand back over to Jen now, I think. Oh, no, I'm not. Sorry. Ignore me. Um, I think we've got we're moving on to the second question. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, time for me to ask my second question, which is thinking specifically about um, the open aspect of open AI. Um, what do we think that uh, the term of openness and the concepts of openness bring to AI? And how does this concept of open source or open or open AI more vaguely, how does it help or hinder us in envisaging the future that we want to build? Um, and I'm gonna start with uh, David for this question. Thanks. Yeah, and I actually wanna start with a, a, a quote from Paula Zunray, who is uh, the founder of the open source project, uh, Ghana NLP. Um, and he said uh, that if African um, AI or machine learning researchers are not careful, this new open source movement championed by the richest tech companies will become a mechanism for continued exploitation of our human capital and continent. And what I take that to mean is that um, if we look at where data and where um, work for AI is coming from versus who actually has the resources, the compute, the ability to collect all that data and the, the highly paid, highly you know um, skilled, concentrated labor to make use of those systems, those are often quite different. Um, so while openness can provide like useful attributes such as transparency, reusability, um, extensibility, uh, it doesn't by itself um, guarantee wider scrutiny of the AI system because that requires skilled labor, specialized knowledge, compute, et cetera. So um, to build real systems, to build systems that are at the scale that you and I are familiar with interacting with, GPT or content recommendation algorithms and such, and to actually put those to use in the real world, um, it requires concentrated resources that are in the hands of large tech companies. So open source can allow um, some useful attributes, but unfortunately it can also... Um, serve to simply just concentrate and allow use by the large tech companies that I think we are increasingly as a society becoming skeptical of. Great, thank you. And uh, Abhinaya. Uh... Yeah, so uh, maybe I'll, I'll talk from a language perspective since I'm contributing to Aya. So uh, the reason why uh, I started contributing is because uh, Tamil is one of the oldest languages uh, in the world and it's it's culturally rich. Uh, the literature that we have right now is what is left uh, out of, you know, uh, there was a flood in, in some few, few centuries ago, whatever literature was accumulated in one place, most of it went away in flood and what we have remaining is what is 
there right now and that itself is so huge uh, so uh, i feel in general any knowledge be it open ai or anything knowledge has to be open uh, if imagine if we have not had any kind of literary books to read from uh, if we have not had anyone write about the his prehistoric ages uh, we will not know anything about what has happened in the past right so to me when you say openness in ai it means whatever technological advancements are happening um uh, it has to be put out in the open so that people can carry it forward and build a lot of good things for the community specifically in terms of language i feel uh, we wanted to build an exclusive uh, a system ai system for tamil so that people in the future generation can benefit from it uh, because i have been hearing from uh, my friends or people who have settled uh, outside india uh, specifically who are from tamil nadu they are losing touch with the language because they don't speak it every day and uh, their kids they don't talk the, in tamil because they are learning through an english medium right so uh, it's very difficult to bring you know keep that culture alive so to me when i say okay i want to build something uh, in L i mean llm or any kind of model for tamil i wanted to make sure that whatever knowledge we have in the past is kind of carried to the future so i feel it has to be open uh, to me openness is that like knowledge has to be open and it should be shared across generations so that's what i see uh, when you ask about openness in ai yeah thank you very much avana uh want to invite Marzia and Moffat as well to uh, contribute to this question around what openness in particular brings to um, AI and how it helps or hinders us in envisaging the future we want to build. Uh, yeah, so I, I do want to add to what Abhinaya said in the sense that it's uh, like the, the, the progress and where we are today, the, the progress, especially in the last decade, maybe uh, that was so impressive was because of open research and people sharing what they have been finding. Uh, so in terms of building something uh, big together as a community, as a researcher community, uh, it's, I think, very important to have openness. And it's also what uh, we also saw in the AYA project is how uh, the, the fact that that project is going to be open source, both the data set uh, and the models. It was a huge incentive for many people to join the project and start contributing uh, because at the end of the day, it's volunteer work. So it's really, they are spending their time and effort on something that is hopefully going to, uh, like uh, for Tamil language, for instance, for many of these languages, uh, going to be helpful for future research to build uh, future projects upon uh, this open source collection. Uh, I do also want to uh, mention that I think for me at least, uh, uh, the the argument against openness, it comes from, it's either it uh, comes from a, a monetary incentive uh, position or uh, from this position of self-assuredness that what we have found and what we have built is something that we are the best people to use it uh, and not anyone else. And I think that's not uh, uh, how usually it is. Uh, so just by sharing, uh, you come from a place of uh, maybe humility that this is what we have built and we make it open. So if there's something wrong with it, if there is, uh, a mistake there, people can find that out. Or if it's useful for something else, someone else can build something on top of that. I might not have think about that, but someone else might have. Uh, so I think that's very essential for uh, a healthy research environment. So it, it is part of uh, uh, really openness is part of uh, doing research, especially in our field. Amazing. Thank you very much, Marzia. Uh, Mopa, any comments from you? or? Uh... Yeah, let me just also add just one point about openness. Uh, it's very important that I mentioned that uh, openness is very important, uh, especially when it comes to ethical scrutiny. Uh, scrutiny, uh, scrutiny. So um, in the recent past, people uh, could not just come out and talk and, and, and share their experiences. Uh, but I can see 
now uh, we can come out boldly and say uh, this is wrong and uh, this one needs to be improved and such like stuff. So um, if we share our ideas uh, or maybe give some suggestions on areas of improvement, uh, then that's really good. Yeah. So uh, that's all from me. Thank you very much. Uh, Jen, actually over to you this time. Thanks, Ariel. Um, and I think where the conversation is going, where the comments in the chat are going, leads us really well to our final question. Um, and this will be our final question before we open up um, for a Q&A. So if you do have any questions on your mind that this conversation is sparking, please do put it in the chat or in the etherpad and we'll get to that right after this. So, um, you know, for our panelists, we're seeing a lot of discussion in the chat, um, questioning, you know, what does openness really mean in this context? What outcomes does it enable and for who? Um, and all of this is, is really going to be part of the OSI deep dive on defining open source AI, uh, which this talk will contribute to. So for the people um, like ourselves who are interested in defining open source AI or having a better understanding of what this means, what is one thing that you are hoping that they will take away from the conversation that we've just had? If you can think of one or two. Um, so if we could start with Marzier. Uh, yeah, so I think one thing for me is that uh, the uh, like for for me openness comes from a lot of uh, comes with a lot of positive aspects uh, but one thing that i think is important to also have with it is accountability in general so just because something is made open uh, it uh, shouldn't mean that uh, we are not responsible anymore for for what we have built so uh, maintaining it updating it trying to address if there are like fundamental issues and risks with it uh, so I think it's very important uh, because the, the the positives are huge for me just like putting uh, it's essentially giving power to the powerless in my eyes even though I agree with David it comes with a lot of this strings of you also need resources you also need like a compute you also need need a lot of different things to fully benefit from it uh, but I think it's uh, the least that we can do at this point uh, so to actually have like some balance in the world but it's important to also to look at it and come with it with a uh, uh, in a responsible way and not just also like the generic responsible way is like try, really trying to be uh, accountable for what you are building and what you are making open uh, for everyone else. Thank you, Marzier. Mofat, would you like to go next? Yeah, uh, so for me, I will say, um, I will just say that um, the openness uh, is very important uh, as it uh, enables people to collaborate and be transparent in everything they do. So I would just encourage people to be responsible and uh, in the event that they face any challenge, uh, they just speak out and share their mind uh, because you may never know uh, who is outside there who can be able to uh, to give you ideas uh, or now you can um, move around these challenges. So. I think uh, that's very important to me, uh, yeah. Thank you, Mofa. Abhinaya, would you like to go next? Uh, yeah, I, I think I'm gonna steal the point that David said at the beginning, like uh, since AI is built for us, I think uh, we should all be part of it. I think that's one takeaway that I would take from the session. Uh, like we are also like me along with some other uh, people uh, who are really passionate about building something for Tamil. Uh, we are building a nonprofit community of our own. Like we are not affiliated to any uh, organizations or anything, but we wanted to do something for Tamil. So we are in the process of doing it, I guess. Uh, people like us should start doing uh, so like more for their own communities or their, the problems that they are dealing with. Uh, I think that's what we should all take away from the session, I guess. Yeah, that's that's my point. 
Thanks, Avinaya. Over to you, David. Yeah, and I I echo what folks have been saying here, and especially uh, Marzia earlier in a question she mentioned um, that people who are anti-open tend to have a monetary incentive to to be anti-open. Um, like they have their model that is really good, and they don't want it to be open for other people to use, for example, or um, they make arguments such as like, what I at least heard in what you were saying was like, we know how to use this better than you, or it's unsafe if other people use it or something. Um, so I'm not advocating for or against openness here, um, but I'm trying to uncover or think about why people make those arguments. And I think you pointed us in the right direction. Oftentimes they're being used by companies to lobby. Um, they're being used to um, the arguments, rhetoric around open is being used to argue um, for like uh, that open source AI is a danger or something and that we ought to sort of limit who has access or that conversely, openness will naturally allow broad benefit from AI and therefore um, we don't need to be as worried about big tech concentration where in fact it's the resources that we need to be worried about not the um, who has technical access. So um People have also been, the companies have been also advocating for sort of open source exemptions from in, in, from budding AI regulation. And I think this is, again, another way that openness is used. So um, used rhetorically in lobbying, I should say. Um, so in light of this, I think that we need to think about the relationship between open source AI and corporate power. Um, open can, and in many cases does, entrench corporate power in AI rather than necessarily democratizing it. So I would sort of ask um, us to think about um, in light of any any kind of open position or in light of openness at all, who actually has the power to build AI systems um, and the resources to build AI systems at any reasonable scale. A great question to close on um, as we move into the Q&A. Um, thank you to our panelists for a great discussion, some really interesting themes in your closing statements on accountability, transparency, community, AI as something we all have a stake in, and also um, the misuse of open for lobbying and corporate power entrenchment. So um, a huge round of applause for our panelists, and I think we are right on time um, at the top of the hour to begin the Q&A. Right, I think we're handing it to Anne. Hello, I'm back. Um, let me see if 